Hello, precious people of God. Trust you are doing well by the grace of God. We thank God for yet another day to spend time with Him, another day to commune with Him. I want us to take a short exercise, and that is, I want you to click on that like button to help spread this good news abroad. I want you to help us share this good news, and that you too will also recommend this channel, this video to others, and they will also be a blessing. Also, let's take a short reading from Job chapter 38, verses 12. It says, Has thou commanded the morning since thy days, and then caused the day spring to know its place? Now, this tells us of the great opportunities, of the great blessings we enjoy as children of God when we speak into our day. And so, it is what we are about to do. Open your heart, be alert, prepare your spirit as we receive inspiring messages from the man of God, Apostle Joshua Selman. Also, if you are new here, hit on that subscribe button for us and then on that notification bell. Keep sharing this message abroad, keep sharing on Facebook, keep sharing on YouTube to invite others to join us as we bless the world. You are a blessing. Thank you. Are you giving God quality thanks for tonight? For your manifold blessings? For your good hand upon our lives? You have done all things well, and to you be all the glory. Someone is telling God, thank you. Shadi barato sabradi belandosia. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. They go from strength to strength. Everyone that appears before the Lord in Zion. Hallelujah. Now cry your heart before the Lord and say, give me an encounter tonight. Give me a destiny defining visitation. Someone is praying. A destiny defining visitation. A destiny defining visitation let me hear something that will change my life forever let me encounter a dimension of the spirit that will cause me to flourish even in the spirit for in Jesus mighty name we pray in Jesus mighty name we pray the church is called the house of God primarily because of the presence of God not just the presence of men what gives value to church is not the preacher necessarily not the members necessarily not the excellence necessarily what gives value to church is the presence of God when you take away the presence factor it can no longer be called the house of God. The singular definition of the house of God is not just where God dwells, but where he has chosen to reveal himself. Jacob said, the Lord was in this place and I knew not. He said, surely this is the gate of heaven. This is the house of God. Hallelujah. I welcome you to Koinonia. We are committed to ensuring that every service becomes for you a destiny defining moment and that is by the word of God that is by the ministry of the Holy Spirit hallelujah our approach is always the word of God in partnership with the ministry of the Spirit and so I welcome you to a destiny defining encounter and I assure you truly tonight will be one of those services you will not forget in a hurry it's a believer shouting amen Make up your mind already that I will not be a spectator. Hallelujah. You must be an active participant. How? Number one, by listening. Not just hearing, listening. To hear means to just allow sounds to enter through your ears. To listen means to connect your hearing to purpose. Your attention is there. Your heart is connected to. Hallelujah. And then, of course, you listen with the determination to practice what you are hearing. Are we together? 
When you listen just for the purpose of awareness, it will not profit you. They heard the word just like we did, but the word did not profit them, not mixed with faith in them that heard it. Hallelujah. And so I bless you all in the name of Jesus, and may tonight be an extraordinary encounter, and our family connecting across the globe. May God bless you. This is Koinonia. Please be seated. And while seated, let's honor again Reverend Akila, this time around with his dear wife. Let's give them a big coin on your welcome. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma. And to everyone who has come, including our guests, we're a house of honor. You are most welcome in the name of Jesus. A few very important announcements, and then we get straight to um, the word. And I want you to please pay attention. Number one is concerning um, the agro empowerment project by God's grace. Um, our partners, those who are working with the CSS farm, they're done collating all the lists and they've sent it. So we hope that between now and um, hopefully the weekend before the miracle service by God's grace, all those who will be part of it, you will be notified and then a schedule will be created for your training and then you take it from there. So just to let you know, to the glory of God, and we appreciate the CSS group for tirelessly working and um, you can imagine sorting over 4,000 lists and we thank God for their passion and um, their commitment. And remember as always, this is our commitment. We are not doing everything, but we'll do the best that we can do with the time, energy and resources that we have. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. The second assignment uh, announcement is a very important one by God's grace. This week, um, we have a quick trip to Boston, and um, I've had the honor of being invited by Harvard University to, <laughs> amen, praise God. So, I've extended, we have a series of lectures that we'll be delivering, um, Harvard University, to the glory of the name of the Lord. So, we have two lectures, one, their school of divinity, the second is their school of graduate education. This is something only God can do. Hallelujah. Um, praise the name of the Lord. So, Harvard is not a church, it's one of the most prestigious institutions on earth. There are things, I believe that this is a message to the body of Christ. There is nothing God cannot do. Did you hear what I said? There is no man God cannot lift. It's a different thing when a church says, come and organize a program, you see. But these are people, most of them are not even born again. So there are no biases and there are no prejudices. Hallelujah. Many years ago, God told me, if you will let men see me, there is nothing I will not give you. You see, when God does some of the things he does with us, he uses the foolish things. It's a message to people. You see that now. The message there is not that the man of God is rising. The message is that God is still a lifter. Are we together? And so... I want to thank already all the professors and all who have labored tirelessly to put this together. We look forward to a great time. Now, um, just two announcements. So one is the lecture. We have two lectures. One is on the 26th, School of Divinity, and then on the 28th will be the School of Graduate Education. And then, of course, I'm still a man of God. Praise the name of the Lord. So. Um, we're not just talking leadership, human capital development, and national transformation. We have evening meetings also. We've graciously been able to work out something with them so that at least we bless the territory. This is outside of the Harvard community, but it's still uh, within the Cambridge area. And we're trusting God for an exceptional time. It will be two nights, Tuesday and Wednesday. There will be intense moments of prayer and extraordinary encounters. So in the day, we're speaking as leaders, intellectual discussions, and then in the night, 
we take on the ministry regalia. Hallelujah. That is what it means to wear a coat of many colors. Praise the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Now, um, I'm not sure that um, as many people will be allowed for the lecture. You understand that, you know, academic lectures are usually very closed. Um, I know that there's a QR code there, but I'm, I'm sure that it most likely may have been exhausted. Um, I don't want to breach their protocol. They have a way their system works. So, but you can try since they put a QR code there. If you're fortunate to, and it goes through and you're invited to join the lecture, then that is fine. But if you try it and it doesn't work, then don't take it personal. They just have a system um, that works for them. But for the evening meeting, please let me have the bill for the evening. That's my concern now. Um, yes, thank you very much. So um, I know that we're still coming in July for Sound of Revival. And um, I didn't even know at the beginning of the year that I would still be in U.S. at this time. My mind had always been on July, but God does his things and we're yielded vessels when he gives a matching order. And I know that this is a prophetic thing that God is doing. So it's beyond just delivering a lecture. We're importing something great, something spiritual. We want to deposit a dimension of God's presence and plant a revival there in the name of Jesus. So all who can, I know that uh, particularly our U.S. family, I'm not sure that the organizers may have the provision to host as many people who will want to come. So let me say it up front. Not everybody may be able to make it. This is an extra arrangement aside from the lecture so that we're able to reveal Christ to that territory in a more personal way. But you can go ahead and scan the QR code. Let's see as many people as whatever auditorium they'll be using would take. And it doesn't matter whether it's two people or 1,000 or 2,000 or 500. That's not the idea. The idea is to have a seed within that region. Are we together? And so if you are part of our global family or you are following from the U.S., if you are not able to travel down there, that is fine. It may even be better for them so that they are not overwhelmed. You can imagine if you have, say, five, 6,000 people. Um, I don't know what level of arrangement they have made, but you can already imagine it may be overwhelming. So for those who are within the Boston area, please take advantage of it. And um, let's see how God will help us. And those who are far and not around that area, you can connect. We'll walk at seeing that this, the lectures show will not be aired, but we'll do our best to see that um, we make this, we air it on Koinonia Global Platform so that um, at least everyone can follow and then we can be witnesses what God is doing. Hallelujah. So US, this is for you, but of course, this is also for the body of Christ so that we connect. It's going to be a powerful time. Two days, I'll be teaching, we'll be praying. I'll be praying for the sick, ministering to people, prophesying by the Spirit, and um, we trust that God will grant us grace. I believe that God is doing something in America in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we in agreement? And so as we always do, just give us one of the bill for Harvard. Just stretch your hands. You are praying for that. You are praying for me. We're a people of prayer. Our philosophy in this ministry is that as I travel, we go with the spirit and the grace and the backing of God's people. Pray that it will not just be the marketing of self, even though we're speaking to an intellectual community, but that God will import wisdom, wisdom through our communication. He says, I will give you a wisdom and a mouthpiece that your adversary will not be able to gainsay nor resist, that our tongues will be pens of ready writers who communicate truths and share thoughts that are articulate, precise, intelligent, and that even though they are academic discussions, they will draw many to Jesus and plant within them a greater consciousness of faith. Hallelujah. And then let's pray for the evening meetings. In the name of Jesus, let's decree and declare that on account of this meeting, someone will be saved. On account of this meeting, someone will be transformed. On account of this meeting, someone will be healed. That a family living within the Boston, Massachusetts area that have been crying for an encounter for a visitation, that this will be their moment, that a prophet and apostle and evangelist in the making, that God will find a worthy vessel in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Hallelujah. And so, Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you are giving us to extend your influence to the nations, both religious and secular institutions. We pray that you will be glorified. We pray that beyond this, men will be inspired to see that there is nothing you cannot do. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. So the third and final announcement before I get to the word is, by the grace of God Almighty, our Koinonia Global Conference for this year will be from November, uh, Thursday the 14th to Sunday the 17th. Hallelujah. Now, by, this is not the name it will be called. This is just a teaser. By Miracle Service, we'll bring the proper bill for it. This is just something they just made just to organize the announcement. But you write it down. This one is for Koinonia Global. This is for the body of Christ, but this is our conference. Hallelujah. Are you excited? Mark your calendars and everyone from across the globe. Once you are on earth, find your way to Abuja. Come from everywhere. All the continents. All um, the nations, as many as can be represented. This is a global, this is our apostolic convention as a ministry, and it's going to be an awesome time. It starts from Thursday, the 14th of November, to Sunday to end with a miracle service. Hallelujah. And so it's going to be two sessions morning, evening, morning, evening. It's going to be a feast of the Spirit like you have never encountered. Hallelujah. We trust God for an extraordinary moment. You will be proud of being part of this vision in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So we'll pray on that next week. We'll bring a proper bill for it, and then we'll announce it. But please let our global family know that this is our own conference. Other details will come next week, but we thank God. Are you happy about the many things God is doing? The meaning of that is that you cannot remain where you are. You must keep rising. In the name of Jesus Christ. Um, there are vehicles that are connected using a lever system to other, maybe other carriages. And they don't, the engine does not have to be connected there. You just put tires. And when the main vehicle is moving, it drags the others by force. Hallelujah. And this is what God is doing. This year you must go forward. It will be clear in your life that God is not only visiting you, he's rewarding you. Yeah. I like, I think that should be Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 15. Maybe this is a prophetic word for someone. Isaiah 60 and verse 15. It just came to my spirit. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee. He says, I will make thee an eternal excellency and a joy of many generations. Yeah. Where people have said, people like you don't rise. Where people have said, those from this family doesn't rise. God will shock men this year. In the name of Jesus Christ. Your rising will be unstoppable. Because it is by the Spirit. Listen, I want you to respect the ministry of the Word. And respect the ministry of the Spirit. God is able to take men from anywhere to anywhere. Deuteronomy 28, it says, If it shall come to pass, if thou shalt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to do and observe all his commandments which I commanded this day. Result, the Lord your God will set thee on high. I like this. Above all the nations of the earth. Not above your village. Not above your community. He says you will be blessed in the city and you will be blessed in the country. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 12, 2 and 3. Blessing Abraham. He made some very profound statements. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3. I will bless them that bless thee. And curse him that cursed thee. Then he says, in thee, in thee, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I'm saying it again. You will not be small this year. 
receive it as a prophetic word you will not be small this year my God will expand you and enlarge you your enemies will watch with shock and wonder as God lifts you did you hear what I said those that have despised you despise your ministry despise your family right before your eyes my God will prepare a table for you in the name of Jesus Christ This is what it means to enjoy the ministry of the Spirit. Adonai, Lamb of God, you are worthy, worthy of my praise. King of kings, Lord of lords, let your kingdom reign in my life. Adonai, Adonai, let your kingdom come, it's our prayers and ministry, let your kingdom come, let your kingdom rule, Allah Salah Brandagada. Let your kingdom rule. Let your kingdom reign in my life. It's my prayer tonight. Let your kingdom reign in my life. Let your kingdom reign in my life. We're praying. Let your kingdom. feel like speaking over your life one more time you will be a sign and a wonder honestly you will be a living sign and a wonder listen that men will sit down and your life will be a scripture that people will read out they will marvel and wonder how could God lift like this how could God give wisdom like this I pray it upon your life may you be a sign and a wonder you are part of a ministry that is a sign and a wonder. May that gene flow through your spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Now, listen, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to trust the truths that you are receiving not because of the person teaching it but because of the integrity of the one who backs what is being taught are we together yes koinonia is not just a ministry it's a school of the spirit and like i have taught you there is a making that is happening to you you don't become in one day so be patient with god you don't become in one day so be patient with your destiny the Bible says, now are we the sons of God. It says, and it doth not yet appear. You may not look like it, but I assure you by the integrity of Scripture that if you pay attention, don't choose what you want to listen to. If you trust the person teaching you, submit yourself. It says, meditate on these things. Give yourself, not just listen, give yourself wholly to them. And it says, you're profiting will appear unto all your profiting will appear unto all God is not a politician unfortunately God is not some businessman whose hand you can manipulate are we together if you walk in keeping with his truth the Bible says he's no respecter of persons mysteriously but predictably he will lift you and he will turn your life to be a sign and a wonder this is what God is making out of you it's important that I keep reminding you of this picture. Remember, I taught, was it last week or week after, before, about the various kinds of mirrors that you look at. Some of you have looked at the mirror of culture, the mirror of whatever it is, and you are not seeing what God is doing. 
tonight journey with me as we look at the mirror of the word so that you see what God is making out of your life as a prophet, making out of your life as an apostle, making out of your life as a pastor, making out of your life as a businessman. Are we together? Making out of your life as a parent, making out of your life as a supposed nobody. Nobodies are empty enough to be filled by God. See, when he comes and finds you full of yourself, he will leave you in your pride. But when he comes and finds you in a state where you know you are not much on your own, then you give him room to fill you. Hallelujah. Fasten your seatbelts tonight as we explore God's word. I'm teaching tonight on the spirit of revelation. I want to teach you how to derive profit from scripture. It's going to be a very interesting discussion. And whilst you are listening, something will fall upon you from heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ. The eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. You will step into a greater comprehension of scripture with proof to show that your understanding is not fruitless. The spirit of revelation. The spirit of revelation. My focus tonight is to help us understand how to derive profit from scripture. A world and the Christian community, the average Christian has a Bible in their house. Here's mine, upstage here. Most of us have us either in hard copy or electronic versions. And most believers are students of scripture. Most students, believers study. But it is very clear from our results and from our understanding that for the most part, the average believer has not been guided into the dynamics of de deriving profit from scripture hallelujah and if you are not taught about this mysterious book you see called the bible and how the spirit of revelation helps men to profit from scripture the bible will remain a burden to you that does not carry any profit it will remain a religious book or one of those historic monuments that you have around your life. Please, I want you to pay attention. I assure you that your destiny and your spiritual understanding depends on the light you are about to hear. Let's talk a bit about the Bible. While I was preparing my notes, I just thought to spend a few minutes discussing this Bible so that you understand a few things. So let's do a bit of theology. Are you ready? The Bible, as we know, is a collection of 66 books. This version of the Bible that we know. I wrote a few things here, and just let me read while you listen. The Bible is a collection of 66 books. There are 66 books recorded here, and 39 of them make up what we call the Old Testament. Say Old Testament. Don't worry, keep being childlike. Just say Old Testament. And the remaining 27 are uh, the New Testament. Of course, we know that there are other um, references. For instance, like the Roman Catholic Bible, there are a lot of other provisions beyond the 66 books. Just to mention them, I think in the Roman Catholic Bible is about 73 or so. There are a number of additions, um, books, particularly in the Old Testament, the Tobit, the Judith, First and Second Maccabees, Siraj, and then Wisdom of Solomon, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, in addition to the Bible, there are many other extra biblical materials. The books of Joshua, the Annals of the Kings, are we together? The books of Enoch, and a lot of other materials. But then we're dealing with the 66 books as we know. Are we together? Now, the Bible, as we know from a historic standpoint, the Bible was written by over 40 authors. At least 36 of them are mentioned as the authors of those Bibles. Now, we know from theology and we know from Bible history that there were many other people that wrote the Bible. And some books of the Bible, uh, till date, there's not been an agreement. Even among the rabbinical institutes, there's not been an agreement as to who was the author of some of these books. But just for you to know, the Bible contains 66 books, um, 39 Old Testament, 27 the New Testament, 
And then, of course, written by over 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years. Amazing, isn't it? That from Genesis, at least as we know, from the time the documentation started till the last, the, the distance, the gap, is about 1,500 years. Hallelujah. Now, the Bible tells us, we, I want us to look at a very interesting scripture. I think it's a scripture that um, has been a great blessing to many, but it's brought a lot of confusion. Second Timothy chapter 3, please. From verse 16. Second Timothy 3. I'm teaching on the spirit of revelation. Let's read together. Ready? One, two, read. Come on, read like people who have life, power, and hope. Ready? One, two, go. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Mm -hmm. For correction, for instruction in righteousness. Just stop at verse 16. So the Bible tells us, and as written in scripture, that all scripture is profitable. That's the word that I want us to see. That the Bible scripture is profitable. Now, let me explain to you what this means. And my discourse, as far as the Bible is concerned, will be trying to give you light. If you do not understand what this means, you will never grow spiritually. Are we together? God prevailed upon the human authors of the Bible. Watch this now. God prevailed upon the authors of the Bible so that while using their own styles of writing and in spite of the differences in their understandings and their personalities, they still recorded exactly what God intended. Are you understanding me now? That in as much as the authors had different personalities, they had different styles of writing, some from a historic standpoint, some from a, a poetic standpoint. Are we together? some from an archaeological standpoint, some a presentation of literature, and it didn't matter what point. The point here is that God prevailed over the human authors of the Bible so that in spite of their styles of writing, in spite of their level of understanding, many times in Scripture we see progressions in the understanding and the revelations of some of these authors. The Bible tells us that they were able to record as God intended. Now watch this. When the Bible says all scripture was inspired by God, I want to explain to you what that means and what that does not mean. The Bible was not dictated by God. No. When it says all scripture was inspired by God, it does not mean the Bible was dictated by God. It means it was guided and inspired by him. There were all kinds of authors in the Bible. Authors ranging from doctors, some of them, tax collectors, some of them, fishermen, some of them, shepherds, some of them, nomads, some of them, military people, some of them, kings, some of them, hedonistic people. In the Bible, donkeys spoke. In the Bible, Satan spoke. In the Bible, angels spoke. In the Bible, animals spoke. In the Bible, men spoke, sometimes before and after their encounter with God, like Paul, like um, um, who else, Abraham, an idol worshiper and all of the Chaldeans, now becoming the father of many nations. Now, watch this. The central point of the Bible, listen, please, you have to listen. The central point of the Bible is God, his love for creation, man's fall, and his inadequacies, Jesus as the Savior and only remedy, and then the gospel of salvation in its entire scope. It's a long read, but I'll take it again. That the central point of the Bible is God, his love for his creation, man's fall and inadequacies, Jesus as the Savior and only remedy. And then the gospel and salvation in all its ramifications or the entire scope of it. 
one last time to give you the patience to write that the central point of the Bible is God, his love for his creation, man's fall and inadequacies, Jesus who came as savior and only remedy, and then the gospel and salvation in its entire scope. This is the central point of the Bible. Are we together? If you're following, say amen. amen. Now watch this. The accuracy of the Bible, I wrote it here and I want you to listen. The accuracy of the Bible is not in the flawlessness of its writings. Listen, please. The accuracy of the Bible is not in the flawlessness of its writings, nor the personality of the authors, but in its ability to deliver God's intent as far as the revelation of God, Jesus, man, and salvation is concerned. The accuracy of the Bible is not in the flawlessness of its writings. That means when we say the Bible is accurate, what makes the Bible accurate is not the flawlessness of the writings. Are we together? What makes the Bible accurate is not the dexterity of the personality of the writers. What makes the Bible accurate is its ability to deliver God's intent as far as the revelation of God, the revelation of Jesus, the revelation of man, and the revelation of salvation is concerned. So the Bible is only accurate if you look at it in its ability to reveal God, to reveal Jesus, to reveal man, and to reveal salvation. Now, you have that down? Is God working on your understanding? So when we say scripture is accurate, we are not saying scripture is accurate. In fact, let me just read this. I'm doing a bit of dictation. Be patient with me. The Bible I wrote here is not flawless as an archaeological material. No, it is not. As an archaeological material, it is not flawless. The Bible as a historic material is not flawless. The Bible as a capture of literature is not flawless. There are many books, for instance, that were written even by the authors that wrote some of this book in the Bible that were not captured there. That alone already dents the wholesomeness of the Bible from an archaeological or historic, are we together, standpoint. There are 66 books that were canonized when you study Bible history. But Moses did not just write the first five books, for instance. Genesis down to Deuteronomy. They are not the only books Moses wrote. There were other books he wrote that did not make it in the Bible. So we are saying the accuracy of the Bible is not in its archaeological flawlessness. When you get an archaeologist to vet the Bible, he will find many things wanting as far as the presentations are there. When you get a historian to vet the Bible as a history book, are we together? He's going to find many things wanting there. When you vet the Bible as a capture of literature, many people will even edit it. Look at me. Have you found yourself reading scripture and you see certain words written in italics? Have you seen that? Do you know why it is written in italics? In Bible history, those writings were not part of the original manuscript. They were imported so that they will help give perspective to your understanding. Are we together? And most of those who did those additions were not necessarily believers. Are we together now? Yes. Now, when Jesus and the plan of salvation becomes your compass, watch this. When Jesus and the plan of salvation becomes your compass for navigating the scripture, then it is accurate. The accuracy of scripture in, is in its ability to reveal God, Jesus, man, 
and salvation, regardless the various authors. So when you say the Bible is accurate, it is accurate because regardless the imperfections, regardless the archaeological flaws, historical flaws, literature flaws, are we together? Yes. Flaws in writings and interpretations, when they were translated from Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, Latin, down to English, or whatever expression, regardless it, all those dents did not affect the purity of communicating the person of God, the purity of communicating the person of Jesus, the purity of helping you understand man, and the purity of the gospel and the plan of salvation. This is very powerful. Mm. Now, when the Bible says all scripture was inspired by God, you understand what it means now. Because the attention of God in moving those men to write was not necessarily the accuracy of the statements written. It is that in, that, in the statements that they wrote, sufficient information was given there to help men know God, to help men understand the state of man, to help men know Jesus Christ, and to help men understand the gospel and the plan of salvation. If you navigate scripture using the lens of any other thing, you will find a lot of inaccuracies. Hallelujah. So settle it for a fact that the Bible as an archaeological material is not flawless. The Bible as a historical material is not flawless. The Bible as a literary material, a piece of literature, is not flawless. It is only when you bring the Bible with respect to its ability to reveal God, with respect to its ability to reveal Jesus, with respect to its ability to reveal the state of man, and with respect to its ability to communicate the gospel and the plan of salvation. That is where the accuracy of scripture lies. Believers, are we learning now? That means anybody who tries to study the Bible and your lens is from any other thing and not the string of God, Jesus, man, salvation, you will really not understand the Bible. In fact, many things written there will annoy you. Are we together now? You will see a plethora of disjointed statements and supposed controversial statements. And at the end of it, it will only plant debates and arguments in your spirit. Because you see, the central reason for the arrival of the Bible was still achieved. And so every other imperfection in the mind of God does not matter. Provided the believer studies scripture from the lens of the revelation of God, the revelation of the state of man, the revelation of Jesus, the revelation of the gospel, and the plan of salvation. This is what makes the Bible a sacred material. Are we together now? Hmm. We're discussing the spirit of revelation. That means if you use the Bible as a prosperity book alone, there are many things you will find wanting. When you read the book, when you open the Bible, watch this, and you read it as a marriage counseling book alone, you may find many things you may not agree with. If you open the Bible and read it as a career book alone, you will find many things wanting. Because the idea, when the Spirit of God brought the authors, the goal is not that it just solves every problem arbitrarily. The central focus is to help you know God, help you know Jesus, help you understand the state of man, and help you understand salvation. Are we together? Now, there are times that you watch movies, and in those movies, there are other parts that you wonder why they were added in the movie. Are we together? They are there. You can't take them away. They add spice to the movie, but there is usually a central theme around it. Is that true? And so if you want to understand the movie, you keep your gaze on the starring actors and what is happening. All the things that happen on the side, you don't lose focus of it. Are we together? Yes. The reason why many believers do not understand scripture is because they do not understand how scripture should be studied. There is a true north just for want of word, there is a central navigation system
by which you understand scripture. If you approach scripture isolating the revelation of God, isolating the revelation of the state of man, isolating the revelation of Jesus, isolating the revelation of the gospel and salvation, the Bible will be a compendium of confusion. You will never be able to find the accuracy there. I repeat, therefore, that the accuracy of scripture is not in its archaeological flawlessness. The, accu the, the accuracy of scripture is not in its his in fact is not even in its intellectual flawlessness there are many things that if you study in scripture intellectually it will not add up and yet this is the bible recommended to reveal god hmm. are we together now let me answer one question before we go to the spirit of revelation if the bible is centrally focused on god Man's condition, Jesus as the remedy, the gospel and salvation in its entirety. The question now becomes, can a believer use the Bible to study other aspects of human issues? Are we together? If the Bible is centered on God, man's state, Jesus, the gospel and salvation, can I use the Bible to solve other issues in life? The answer is in that same scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is profitable. How many? All scripture. Including the things that look like nonsense in the Bible. The Bible says under a certain condition, they can become profitable. All scripture. The reason why in spite of the limitations and the imperfections of the Bible, you don't need to throw them out. Is because there is a provision by God to make all scripture profitable for you. Hmm. Are we together? Watch this. While Jesus walked upon the earth, I hope you know that Jesus came as the word. While Jesus walked upon the earth, his focus was salvation. Am I right? Yet, he taught on other aspects of human life. Jesus did not just come and focus on salvation alone. His ultimate focus was salvation, revealing God to men and becoming that mediator, becoming that substitute in death. However, in the course of his sojourn on earth, the Bible is clear as to the fact that Jesus addressed various issues around human life. That means it is wise to conclude that even though the Bible is centrally focused on the revelation of God, man, Jesus and salvation, the Bible is also profitable as a spiritual resource that can help man navigate through all the issues in life and destiny. But the issue is that it does not happen under all conditions. We are discussing the spirit of revelation. Hallelujah. Jesus taught on marriage. Jesus taught on relationships. Jesus taught on finance extensively so. Jesus taught on diligence. Jesus taught on greatness and the price of greatness. Jesus taught on forgiveness and empathy. Jesus taught on leadership. Jesus taught on politics. Are you seeing the other areas? Now, these areas were not directly connected to the core assignment, yet they were captured in his discourse. The Bible does not hide the fact that he met a tax collector. They discuss economic issues. He discussed the issues of giving. Jesus discussed the issue of marriage and the complexities around marriage. They asked him questions. He did not run away from it. Are we together? Jesus discussed the issue of laziness. He gave parables that were not connected to salvation at all. They were parables that dealt with human living. It is safe to consider, therefore, that the Bible, even though centrally, it is meant to reveal God, I repeat again, the state of man, to reveal Jesus as the remedy and to help man understand the gospel. It is also wise to allow the Bible to be extended to solve every other problem in human life. Hmm. Hallelujah. Are we learning so far? Do you understand everything I just said? Now, let's discuss the spirit of revelation. Ephesians 1 verse 17. I receive 
I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up, exalted. I receive, I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up, glorified. Breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe upon my life. Breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe, Lord. Listen to me. You have to read the Bible as a spiritual man to profit from it. Even if you are reading about business, even if you are reading about marriage, even if you are reading about relationships, if you read the Bible as an intelligent intellectual, you will find many gaps. If you read the Bible entirely as a businessman, the Bible demands that there must be a state you assume for the profit of it to be derived. Are we together now? The Bible was designed to profit men to the degree to which they are spiritually minded as they read. The Bible says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, a businessman can open the Bible and read it and find valuable business lessons. But eventually, as you sojourn, you will find things that don't make sense and will not add up. Are we together? If you are a marriage counselor and you open the Bible looking for ideas, you will find valuable ideas that appeal to the intellect. But eventually, you will find confusing statements. If you read the Bible just as any other person who is not spiritual, it will profit you for a while. But one day, you will stumble across thoughts statements, ideas, expressions, stories, and personalities that will trouble and disturb your understanding. So, Ephesians 1 and verse 17, Paul for you, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, watch this, and the Father of glory may give unto you, I hope you know he's speaking to people who are already born again, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Next verse. He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, ye may know the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us world who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, please lend me your attention again. Every story in the Bible contains within it, listen, every story in the Bible, in fact, it is even safe to say, every statement and every expression in the Bible contains within it lessons or principles that can cause the believer to walk in victory. Did you get that? Every statement, every story, every expression in the Bible contains within it lessons or principles that can help the believer to walk in victory. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, the Bible says in Romans 15 and verse 4, whatsoever things were written, it didn't matter what it was, even if it is statistics, even if it's the statements that Satan made, even if it's the statement that demons made, whatsoever were written aforetime, Provided they were written in this book, the Bible says there is profit from them. You either have a lesson to learn from them or you have a principle to derive from them. Are you learning how to profit from scripture? Otherwise, why would you read in the Bible statements that Satan made? How does that profit you? Why would you read in the Bible statements that hedonistic people wrote? Why would it profit you? The Bible would have just edited statements that only Jesus said or only born-again people said. 
Yet, the Bible is not afraid to scatter through its pages. Sometimes disturbing writings. Men curse God in the depravity of their minds. And it was recorded in the Bible. So when the Bible says all scripture is inspired, it is not the accuracy of the statement that was inspired. It's the fact that God, God insisted that that statement, no matter how insulting or no matter how glorifying it is, that it should be written. That is why he did not leave you to read the scripture alone. There is a provision he gave you, a lens from which you can read any scripture and derive profit from it. The name of that provision is the Spirit of of revelation the spirit of revelation is the profit factor in the believers learning scripture that when you engage scripture from the lens of the spirit of revelation any verse will profit you are we together you will find very disturbing scriptures in the Bible like a lying spirit departed from God and came to Saul and that statement is inconsistent with God's character. At least we learn God by looking at the person Jesus. Jesus never lied. He was full of grace and truth. So we have a right to say something was wrong with the people who wrote that statement. Either they are hearing because they were human, they are receiving. Yet all scripture, including that insulting statement, was inspired by God to be written. Are we together? It is not the insult that God said to write. That means the insult itself does not profit. It does not profit by default. You don't insult God and it is profiting. But it was written there because there is a lesson that can be derived from it that will help you to live a profitable life. I always wondered why certain statements were written. If you have read your Bible properly from Genesis to Revelation and you are sincere, you should have been disturbed. You get to Songs of Solomon, you will jump it quickly and go to the next verse. You get to Leviticus, you are almost feeling sleepy. What in the world is this? Why do I need that for? You get to the book of Proverbs, the first three or four chapters just insults you, it's like a man slapping you. And you are wondering, what in the world is this? You get to the book of Revelation, you are scared to death. You want to quit your job. What sort of a compendium? What was God about? Writing all those statements. And this vile and this beast, he sat on a horse, he judged the nations, people were roasted with fire. How does that encourage me? All scripture were inspired. Koinonia, are you learning now? It was not the events that were inspired. It was not the accuracy of the speakings that were inspired. But they were captured together because God would never let you learn them alone. He was going to give you the spirit of revelation. And the spirit of revelation is the one who guides you into all truth. That means not everything is truth, but everything is written. Not everything is truth. Did you hear what I said? Not everything is truth, but everything is written. <laughs> not everything is truth, but everything is written. So the Holy Spirit guides you through the stories through both the sense and nonsense and brings you to the point of scripture where you find truth. It is the reason why you can read a book and see a verse that may not have made sense, but because the breath of the Spirit comes upon that verse, you learn a lesson. For instance, you read the book of Ecclesiastes. If you read it intellectually, you will hate the Bible because you will think it is saying you should not walk, you should not do anything. Here was the frustration of the preacher. He said, here is the conclusion of the matter. Of reading many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness to the flesh. He says, this is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments and said, this is the whole duty of man. So should I resign from my job as a result of this threat? <laughs> so it means I should not press to increase all scripture. You read that thing intellectually. You will come up with errors and credit it to God. And God says, I have no hand in it. I never ask you to read it intellectually or just historically you read all of those things as a build up while waiting for the spirit of revelation to sieve through the limitations and the personalities of those who wrote it and bring life to you the sun will no more give you sunlight by day the moon will no more give you moonlight by night 
Jehovah will be your everlasting. I like that one. Jehovah will be your everlasting light. Jehovah will be your everlasting light. Listen. Listen, can I tell you, many preachers, many businessmen, many intellectuals have been frustrated reading the Bible. And it's just that sometimes we keep quiet so that it doesn't look like we hate God. But there are many people who are tired of reading a string of controversies in the scripture. And sometimes they get embarrassed that certain things should be written in scripture. Are we together? Look at certain explicit statements for want of word that were written in books like Songs of Solomon. Look at certain, I mean, the Bible said, perfect love, cast out fear. But you read the book of Revelation and see from beginning to the end. Read it in Amplified. <laughs> By the time you are halfway that book, you will be shaking physically. Will any man survive? If God did not stay this plague for, this plague for the sake of the elect, Ah, that means are there people who will survive this? It is easier for a, uh, how does he put it, for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. What is the meaning of that? That means I'm going to hell? <laughs> Jehovah will be your everlasting light. Jehovah will be your everlasting light. Sun will no more give you sunlight by day. The moon will no more give you moonlight by night. Jehovah will be your everlasting light. One more time. Jehovah will be your everlasting light. Ye air, not knowing the scriptures. See that? He says, search the scriptures. For in them you think you will find life. The scriptures testify of me. The scripture was not written for historians. The scripture was not written for archaeologists. The scripture was not written for um, English speaking people or any language. The scripture was written for spiritual people. There is a capture of all of these dimensions. But that in themselves they cannot profit the believer. Jehovah will be your everlasting light. Hmm. The spirit of revelation. The sun will no more give you sunlight by day. The moon will no more give you moonlight by night. Jehovah will be your that is the reason why you can read a lot of things and even teach it but the result that follows does not come because light has not come are we together what profits you is not the verse what profits you is the light did you hear what I said what profits you is not the story what profits you is not the personality used what profits you is not the dexterity of the expression what profits you is the light and the spirit entered me when he spake unto me. I needed to hear him, but beyond the words. So the Bible says the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I tell you, many believers do not have revelation knowledge. And many believers do not know that the study of scripture and the profiting of scripture is beyond the realm of archaeology, is beyond the realm of history. Because there is a mystery to this book you are seeing. As opened as it is, there are seals in the spirit. It is your responsibility to open the book, but only the spirit of revelation can unlock the seals. Otherwise, you will only read a, a, a plethora of disjointed statements that will cause confusion to you, fear, doubts. Sun will no more give you sunlight by day the moon will no more give you moonlight by night jehovah will be your everlasting light hear what the bible says that was the true light 
that lighted upon every man. There are false lights. They carry a semblance of power. They carry a, but they cannot, they don't have the potency to deliver the life of God. Are we together? Spirit. Why did Jesus take the time? Do you know that most of his activity when he walked upon the earth, even beyond his crusades and conferences, most of his time was spent in his teaching ministry. And yet he told the people that the Holy Spirit was still going to come. In spite of the fact that I taught you profitably, there is still the paraclete. There were many things Jesus taught that they did not understand. My question is, how will Jesus teach you and yet you don't understand? Who else should teach? How does this, there were many things he said that they did not understand. After his resurrection, they recall some statements and say, so this is what he meant. Do you know why? Because they were bankrupt of the spirit of revelation. Jesus himself, not a prophet. He was the one who personally taught them. But they were unfruitful in many areas. To the point that the Bible says he opened their understanding that they might understand scripture. But when the Spirit of God came, many things began to make sense to them. Oh, destroy this temple and I'll build it in three days. Hear the foolish interpretation of that scripture when Jesus stood before Herod. This man said he would destroy our temple. He was talking about his body. Are we together? They said you are a king. Are you a king? And Pontius Pilate said, don't you know I have the power to release you? And he said, ah, ah, ah. Even though I'm silent, now you've said something. You do not have any power. No man can have power except it is given to him. It is within my power to command a legion of angels. Jesus was speaking from a realm. Why was he silent? Are you seeing that those guys were interpreting all the materials? The scribes and the Pharisees, in terms of accuracy of scripture memory, none of us till date in this generation, I presume, has the kind of intellectual prowess those people had. For you to be a Pharisee, among the many conditions, you needed to understand the entire Torah of heart. And yet... The one who the scripture said would come was before them and they could not see him. Are we learning? The spirit of revelation. Now watch this. Every story in the Bible, every statement in the Bible, every expression in the Bible whether directly connected to salvation or not, whether directly connected to the revelation of Jesus or not, whether directly connected to the revelation of God or not, under the influence of the spirit of revelation, every story in the Bible can bring forth lessons and can bring forth principles that cause the believer to walk in victory. Did you hear what I said? The profiting of scripture only comes under the influence of the spirit of revelation. Please write that down. The profiting of scripture only comes, is only derived under the influence of the spirit of revelation. Brain plus Bible study may only profit you so far. You will not be at a loss. But the holistic profiting intended for you will not be achieved. It is under the influence of the Spirit of God that the profiting of Scripture is derived. So when the Bible says all Scripture is profitable, it did not lie. Including all the disturbing statements that are surrounded in the Bible. They are not controversies per se. They are controversies if approached historically. They are controversies if approached intellectually. They are controversies if approached just um, in terms of uh, maybe history and literature. But the moment you come under the spirit of revelation, veils are taken away. And you will see things the way it was intended to be seen. Son of man, what seest thou? And he said, the root, the shoot of an almond tree. He says, thou has seen correctly. Means you can see wrongly. You don't have to be blind to see wrongly. Once you are not guided, you will see wrongly. Are we together? 
One time Jesus prayed for a man and his eyes opened, but he saw men like trees and he laid his hands upon his eyes again and it opened and he saw things clearly. Now let's talk about the four assignments of the spirit of revelation. The spirit of revelation has a fourfold assignment in the life of the believer with respect to helping the believer derive profit from scripture and to live an excelling Christian life. Let me repeat myself again, that the spirit of revelation as a dimension of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit has a fourfold assignment in the life of the believer with respect to helping you derive profit from scripture and living an overall excellent spiritual experience. Are you ready? Number one, the first assignment of the spirit of revelation and I hope you know by now that the spirit of revelation is a dimension of the operation of the Holy Spirit. Just like every other expressions of the spirit, it is one spirit, but it's that he, he has compartments and dimensions of his operation. And one of those dimensions is that he can operate as the spirit of revelation. The assignment of the spirit of revelation, listen, is number one, to give you light from scripture. Write it down. The first assignment of the spirit of revelation is to breathe upon scripture. Breathe upon the Bible and cause that regardless what you are studying, you will find light. Light meaning lessons. Light meaning mysteries. Light meaning principles from it that help you know God, help you understand his eternal plan but then also helps you to live an excelling spiritual life. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord, like a candle. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord, like menorah. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord, like a candle. Light me, Lord. Light me, Lord. The assignment of the spirit of revelation is to give you light. So you can come as a historian, it's not wrong. You can come as an intellectual, it is not wrong. The Bible does not demand that you throw away your brain, nor your knowledge of archaeology, history. In fact, the knowledge of those areas aforementioned even become a, a great support system when the Spirit of God breathes upon you. Are we together? When the Holy Spirit breathes upon you, then all those other things now add to its profiting. History is not wrong in studying scripture. That's why we learn. We have lexicons, Greek and Hebrew lexicons. We have all kinds of commentaries that we add together as we study scripture. It takes intellect to study those things. They give you contextual backgrounds. Are we together? There is what we call in theology the principles of biblical interpretation. That means how you interpret scripture for your profiting. That is an intellectual guide, but it is profitable. That is where you learn things like the law of first mention. You learn the things like the law of single mention. Are we together? The factors that must be in place for any thought to be called doctrine. Not everything in the Bible is doctrine, even though everything is profitable comes from the Latin word doctrina, a body of knowledge that transforms a student to be as excellent as his master. Are we together? Are we learning? Church is quiet. This is koinonia. So the assignment of the spirit of revelation is to give you light from scripture. You can carry your Bible and read, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him, John 3, 16, should not perish, but have everlasting life. You will stand there brilliant but confused. What did I do that he died for me? Did I ask him to die for me? Did he have to die? How does a creator have to die to save those he created? That is an expression of weakness. Are you seeing the limitations of intellect? He gave his one and only son. Put it there, please. If you read the Bible like that, the first question is, he gave his one and only son. By which wife? By what mother? You see what is happening to your mind? 
whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life what is everlasting life how does it change me i'm all right if you are poor it may make sense what if you are rich what is everlasting life i'm staying in a palace i have a private jet i have this what is everlasting life how does that add to me i have a phd i have an excellent life things are working well how what is everlasting life why do i need it because i look at my life and i do not see anything wrong with my life that necessitates the need for any life i have friends with military i have friends with the law enforcement agents i have friends with the legal institution what is everlasting life that would be your conclusion if the spirit of revelation does not help you but when he opens your eyes the first thing you will see is so loved so loved all those controversies fade immediately the spirit of revelation will guide your heart to the punchline of that statement so loved god so loved and every other verse and statement will just disappear and there will only be three words striking your spirit god so loved god so loved you will not know when you will break down over that scripture and begin to weep this is what he did. So loved. So loved. That can birth an evangelical ministry. Because the, when you stand on a crusade ground, the only thing you will hear is God so loved. And you can begin to weep like the patriarchs who wept. And we did not understand the basis of their crying. They were not people who were driven by arguments. I was watching one of the documentaries of late Billy Graham. And he was having... Um, a discussion with he was going for a, a, a you know a crusade somewhere and they were having I think a radio or a session with the journalists and the rest and they asked him a very serious question they said how are we sure that your crusade here is not just to come and manipulate people into subscribing to a faith that they do not agree with and he looked and smiled and made a very profound statement he said my message is a proclamation I am proclaiming something that has been done my, it's, a, it's a message I was sent to proclaim. I am only a messenger. My assignment is not to explain the dynamics of what happened. I am proclaiming what was done, but that in that message there is the power to heal the total man. I said, this is an evangelist indeed. He conquered nations because the spirit of revelation was upon him. So loved and you are standing there and the, the healing anointing can flow through that revelation. God so loved that crippled man there. God so loved the blind mama at the back of that crusade ground. God so loved the stubborn drunkard that came to that crusade ground. And rather than being judgmental and being angry, because the spirit of God has made scripture to be profitable, compassion is the response. Are we, are, are we seeing now? So while on one hand, what you are seeing is a controversy, what is eternal life? Another person is seeing God so loved. And from that, these three statements, a global ministry can rise that represents the purposes of God. The first assignment of the spirit of revelation is to help you derive light from scripture. The light component of scripture is what empowers you to become what scripture says. The light component from scripture is what empowers you to become what scripture says. Now I understand some of the statements of our fathers where they would say just head knowledge. Men like E.W. Kenyon, Kenneth, Hagin of blessed memory. They would say faith is not mental ascent. Are we together? No, it is not mental ascent. Absorbing the truth intellectually is profitable, but not enough to make you become what it says. As many as received him, he gave them power. When you receive that word, power is derived from it that helps you to become. Power to become. Power to become. Power to become. Power to become a saved person. Power to become a transformed person. Number two, what is the assignment of the spirit of revelation? Are you ready? The first assignment of the spirit of revelation we said is to give you light from scripture let me add to that and then to connect the believer
to God's eternal plan. The first assignment of the spirit of revelation is to give you light from scripture and then to connect the believer to God's eternal plan. You need to add that. To give you light from scripture, but not isolated light. Light that connects you to God's eternal plan. The same 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's read 14 and 15. The light from scripture should primarily connect you to God's eternal plan. It says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. 15. It says, and that from a child. Watch this. Thou hast known the holy scripture, which are able to make you wise, but not just random wisdom, wise unto salvation. Wise unto salvation. Wise unto salvation. The first assignment of the spirit of revelation is helping you to draw light from scripture, and then it connects you to God's eternal plan. Can I give you number two now? The second assignment of the spirit of revelation is to help you draw out light or to help you draw out lessons or principles from scripture. To help you draw out lessons or principles from scripture that empower you to walk in total victory. The spirit of revelation helps you to draw out lessons, principles from scripture that empower you to walk in total victory. That means he's not limited to just giving you light that reveals the eternal plan of God. He does not stop there. He's not just interested in your knowing the eternal plan of God. Are we together? He's interested in your holistic victory. That means if the spirit of revelation comes upon my life, either through the ministry of the teaching priest or my personal encounter with him, the first thing in order of spiritual priority is that the light that comes from scripture connects me to understand God, understand the state of man or my state in light of redemption, to understand Jesus and to understand the gospel and his eternal plan. But it does not stop there. Light will still come by the Spirit to give me the, uh, a knowledge of the lessons and the principles that I need to learn as touching every other aspect of my life. Finances, are we together? Relationships, how to excel in career. Those other aspects will not be left out. In order of priority, the focus of the Spirit of Revelation in bringing the knowledge of Scripture for you is God's eternal plan and His program as captured in Christ, but that it also tends to providing holistic victory by bringing light as the lessons and the principles from Scripture for your total wholesome victory. Number three, what is the third assignment of the spirit of revelation? Are you ready? Listen and then write. Inspiring the mind of the believer to birth thoughts and ideas that translate to productivity and advancement. The third assignment of the spirit of revelation is to inspire the minds of the believer so that you are able to birth thoughts and ideas that translate to productivity and advancement. Isaiah 11 and verse 2 talks about the seven spirits of God. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, the fear of the Lord. And the Bible says, verse 3, that he shall make you of quick understanding. He will do something to your understanding. Job chapter 32 and verse 8, Elihu spoke and said, there is a spirit in man. And he says the inspiration, the same word breath of the almighty, maketh men or giveth them understanding. The third assignment of the spirit of revelation, in addition to connecting you to understand God's eternal plan, in addition to providing the lessons and the principles from scripture that make for your total wholesome victory in life and destiny. That means you should not be an excellent Christian 
and fail in other aspects of your life. In order of priority, you must understand God, his plan, yourself, Jesus, the gospel, salvation. But your finances should speak. Your relationships should excel. Your influence should not be in want. Are we together? The spirit of revelation provides the resources, the lessons to learn, the principles to know, to become a totally victorious believer. And then number three, we said, inspiring the minds of the believer to birth thoughts and ideas that translate to productivity and advancement. Please look up believers. Let me talk to you for a moment. If your Christian experience does not translate to a context that makes unbelievers and the territory around you to acknowledge that there is value. Are we together? One, one of my discussions that I'll be having the lecture in is on the role of faith in contemporary Africa. Are we together now? Does faith still hold relevance in civilization or we should throw it away? Do you know why people are asking those questions? Because if there are many churches, many of us men and women of God, but the society cannot, it is not reflected in the society, the value of being a Christian. Are we together now? The society, the government and the principles and the policies that are put together, they may not necessarily be spiritual, but that in the presence of believers and Christians, the God life must translate into productivity and into advancement. I am a firm believer in territorial transformation as proof that you have encountered God. These are they that turn the world upside down. Not from a fanatical standpoint, are we together? Not from an extremist standpoint, but that you import the value system of the kingdom and you use it to provide policies that enhance men. That's right. The kingdom. The spirit of revelation helps you to birth thoughts, to birth ideas that translate into productivity and translate into advancement. Captains of industry should rise from the Christian fold. Are we together? World changers who love Jesus haven't understood thoroughly the plan of salvation and that you've partaken of it by making Jesus Lord of your life. Now you are able to take advantage of the resources of intelligence and creativity by the Spirit to bet solutions that transform people. That whether people are Christians or non-Christians, they can come to you and they can see the excellency of your spirituality speaking to the growth of society. This is what Jesus left. The kind of Christianity we are doing in this nation and in Africa, I tell you the truth, we will keep flattering ourselves for a long time until the world tells us you are becoming a nuisance because our fanatism is not translating to societal transformation. And you cannot speak to people in power until you can import the reality of the God life. When it changes policies, when it stops crime, are we together? When it helps to bring it and stops, um, you know, all kinds of gender inequality for want of word and all of these things. If because you are a Christian, you treat your wife well. If because you are a Christian, you train the people in your school and the students in your school, that's Christian school. They pass all their work, they are excellent, they are well behaved. You see, you now have the credence to formulate a policy in honor to your faith that government can use because you have results to show. This is how nations are transformed. Nations are not transformed through blind fanatism. The reason is because fanatism is enhanced by small-mindedness. Once your mind is small and you are not global in your horizon, you will believe you are making progress. But there are powers that only understand God as profit to society. Did you hear what I said? You must translate yourself that they can say because a church was planted here, the crime rate in this area just went down. And you can literally use statistics to confirm that from the time this church was planted, on account of the spiritual value that is being communicated from that man of God, that woman of God, that priest, that apostle, that prophet, it has translated to a decline in prostitution. It has translated to a decline in irresponsibility. Men are now taking their place. Families are mended. Are we together? 
People are getting jobs. All kinds of crime is reducing. Nations and governments will call you and say, we are not interested necessarily in the God you serve, but we want to know what policy runs your organization that produces a kind of profit. Now you have the audacity to say, my policies are derived from my convictions, and they will still listen to you because the results are there to show. Your name is to be hallowed. Listen, the church is the light of the world. We are not a congregation of dummies bound by blind fanatism with no profitability to society. God is helping our generation to redefine the value of the Christian faith. We are not a news and so civilization. We may pray in tongues. The world may not understand the praying in tongues, but the creativity that comes from that praying in tongues, they will not deny it. Are we together now? Yeah. This is what God is helping us to do, to penetrate systems and structures, to translate spirituality and give it a context of intelligence that provides value, value that is applicable in nation building, value that is applicable in terms of human resources. Christians should not be part of the membership of a church and after five years, they are not productive. They are not helping themselves. They are beggars. Are we together? Waiting for palliatives. What then is the value of the gospel? If you sell me that kind of gospel, I will reject you. In order of priority, it should be connecting to the eternal plan. But the, spiritual, the spirit of revelation empowers us. If everybody in this place is able to feed 10 people, can that bring impact to our society? Do you think that it, it, it garnishes, it brings beauty to your spirituality? Last year, I had the honor of speaking at the World Conference of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. And one of the things I shared with the people there, thankfully, most or all of them are renowned businessmen, billionaires, millionaires, captains of industry, controllers of systems and structures, but that most of them, if not all of them, at least they call upon the name of the Lord. And one of the things that I taught there was the wisdom of Egypt. Even though Moses was called to be a deliverer, part of his qualification was that God sent him to Egypt to learn the wisdom of the Egyptians. Let me submit to you. There are many Christians who cannot be good governors. There are many Christians who cannot be good presidents. There are many Christians who cannot be good ambassadors. Do you know why? Fanatism without translating spirituality with intelligence in a way that brings profit to society. Chances are excellent now that if I become some kind of position as a Christian, you see, if my mind does not receive a superior kingdom orientation, to know that my jurisdiction is the globe, revealing Christ, but doing that in a way that is not just fanatical. Are we together? That you can be able to statistically prove the value of my knowing God. You see, it is because in this side of Africa, we don't have value for statistics, we don't have value for reviews. Are we together now? In many parts of the world, and if God gives you grace to broaden your horizon, one of the things you will learn is that people don't believe nonsense. When you tell people something works, they will tell you, bring your facts and your figures. That even though the context of what you are communicating is spiritual, if God intended for that gospel to reach men, you should show me statistically. If you cannot show me how they are translated spiritually, show me the moral excellence that was derived. That 10 people, because they came to Christ, society has become better. That an armed robber called Barabbas, that he encountered Jesus Christ. And because of that, show me statistically, the Bible has a statistical proof of transformation. One prostitute met Jesus and as a result, a whole city was converted. One madman met Jesus and a whole city was converted. Jesus was not a fanatic. He transformed people. Are we together? 
He was strong on his convictions as far as representing the father is concerned. But he penetrated systems and structures. Economic systems felt his impact. Religious systems felt his impact. Family life systems felt his impact. Are we together? Intellectual systems felt his impact. He entered the temple and he sanitized all kinds of misuse of God's house. This is Jesus for you. He spoke among people and they saw the wisdom in the things that he said. All those who fought Jesus were people who were living in denial, not ignorance. His statement was clear and unmistakable. Nicodemus came testifying on behalf of the scribes and the Pharisees and say, we know. We, are, we know that you are a man sent from God. It's only that because you've won the heart of the people, it has disturbed us too much. We have to create a formula to dampen your influence. And he died, but he rose. This time around, we are the fruits of his resurrection, extending his value system. I have taught you that the gospel is not only a message that saves. The gospel is a value system that can translate society. All the societies today that we celebrate, at the core of any territorial development is their value systems. And value systems are derived from convictions. It is convictions that translate to value systems, that translates to policies that if enacted, they transform people. Moral excellence is first a mindset, a value system that translates to a policy. The spirit of revelation breathes upon your mind. Is someone learning? The church should not be the only one calling us. The Bible says men will say, come, let us go to the house of the Lord. Are we together? That somebody who is a non-Christian, because of the excellency of your understanding and your applying scripture and the corresponding results, undeniable, that flows through your life. Someone who is a non-Christian can come to you like Nicodemus in the night and say, listen, I don't love Jesus, I don't believe in God, but I cannot deny the fact that you're being a Christian, the impact of your salvation experience, the impact and the dexterity of your spiritual understanding, the intelligence that has come from your spirituality is compelling. Can you teach me his ways? It's easy to win poor people on a crusade ground, but you are going to win kings and nations and territories by importing spirituality to a context whose value can be seen and felt in society. I receive, I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations See Jesus lifted up, exalted, I receive, I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up, glorified. Dr. Miles Munro of Blessed Memory said this, and I quote. He said, leadership is not about maintaining followers. Transformational leaders turn followers to leaders and leaders to agents of transformation. The end product of the journey to your spirituality is not fanatism and extremism. I repeat, the end point at the back of your journey to knowing God understanding salvation and utilizing scripture alongside the ministry of the spirit of revelation is not to produce a profitless fanatic no an intelligent god will not design such a system translating spirituality to a context that can lead to personal and territorial transformation i refer you to my message commanding salvation over territories. You will become a sign and a wonder. 
in the name of Jesus Christ. You will go back to your place of work. Do you know why God does not promote men in the kingdom? Their value will be useless to society. Their fanatism will only become a distraction to many and even lead many through anger away from God, not towards him. So God would rather them remain at a level. Promotion comes when profit can be derived. Many of you are administrators and you are business people. Talk to me, intelligent people. Do you promote someone who will not bring profit to the organization? Part of the principles that you use to promote people is you check their performance before that time. Am I right on that? Their performance in terms of delivery, in terms of representing the values of the company. When you see that these people can be a greater representation, you promote them. That is how it happens too in the kingdom. When God can derive profit from your life, he lifts you so that you will help men see him in a way that properly represents him. The higher you rise, the more confusion you can bring to the name of the Lord if you don't know him. Did you hear what I said? The higher you rise, the more misrepresentation and the more confusion you can bring to the Christian faith and to the name of the Lord. That's why there are people, no matter how they pray and fast, they, are, they will not rise beyond certain things. There is a kind of knowledge they need to take away from their minds. And there is a kind of knowledge about what they need to have so that their rising becomes profitable for the kingdom. Imagine that God gives you access to be invited by the president of a nation as a Christian. And you are given 15 minutes to do a national broadcast. And you are given the liberty to communicate the matters that relate to faith. And then in 15 minutes, you can cause war between two countries because of an abuse of influence. Did you hear what I said? I'm not training you to get a job. I'm not training you to get food. You don't need to be born again to have that. The training you are receiving is turning you to a global wonder. This is why God is re-engineering your understanding so that he can invite you to the gates of nations. There are many believers today if God ever gave them an opportunity to speak his purposes, especially within a secular environment, there will be wars that will last years because the diplomacy of representing the love of God, you will sell the controversies in the kingdom and so many things and create enemies around the kingdom to a point that the government becomes embarrassed for honoring you and your, your testimony becomes a statistical fact that they should fight Christians in that nation. Are we together? There are many nations today that have been shot towards the gospel because individuals who were ill-prepared had access to the audience and had access to the ears of kings. And because they were ill-trained and ill-prepared, they did not know how to, to translate spirituality to a context that brought profiting to the gospel. They misrepresented God and credited it to fanatism. The result was that doors shut for the gospel. But a change is coming to the body of Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. When you give your life to Jesus, you don't become a dummy. You give your life to Jesus and encounter the spirit of revelation. Albeit our focus is not just on prosperity and education and secular advancement. When that becomes the entire scope of our pursuit, it is another kind of error. The centrality of the believer's pursuit must be God, the revelation of God, the state of man. Are we together? If they ask you to summarize the Christian faith and you say, well, God wants to prosper you. He just wants to make you great. You misrepresented God. If you have five minutes to talk about God, what you should talk about is his love connected to salvation. Are we together now? You don't waste that five minutes you have talking about prosperity or advancement. It's a misrepresentation of God. If you have five minutes to articulate your faith, your emphasis should be the central focus of what becomes a pillar of your faith. But if time is extended, you let people know that when he comes, he affects the total man including your finances and the way it happens is that the spirit of revelation can make profiting to come out of scripture can i give you number four breathe lord breathe lord breathe breathe upon my life breathe lord breathe, breathe.
breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe upon my life. I receive, I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up, exalted. I receive and manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up, glorified. Hallelujah. Somebody called me, he sent me a text one time, I may not be surprised, it is following. After we put this our agro program and programs to bless the business people, and he called me and he said, sir, his exact words, he said, pastor, sir, you don't know me, I'm a Muslim, I'm not a Christian, but we're having a discussion about you and the part that touched me was when I saw that you were not just complaining and that you were doing the bits that you were to train people. He said, I was touched. I'm not a Christian. Probably he's following. He said, I was touched. And then he said, my wife listens to you. This is somebody who is aware, a non-Christian. My wife listens to you and I will not stop her because I have seen the value. That thing touched me. Hallelujah. Now, most of you don't come from the north, so you will not understand the implication of that statement. You would have, you have to live in the north to understand what it means for a man to say, listen, I'm not a Christian, but we discussed you here, and based on what, didn't he see healing the sick in Koinonia? That's none of his business. Didn't he see the dishing out of Greek and Hebrew? The point of profiting was when spirituality was translated. Now, when you say God is love to his mind and the mind of his wife, they can say yes. Even though I may not agree with your faith, I cannot deny the value and the profiting that your spirituality has produced. Listen, do you know why Billy Graham was one of the most respected preachers? He did not waste his time in blind, childish, and mediocre debates. His, his idea was to understand scripture with the same. He was not a fanatic. Billy Graham was not the person who was jumping on stage like some of us. But the intelligence he gave to spirituality brought great honor to the name of the Lord. A documentary about Billy Graham shows, and I'm saying that because it's, it's the, the documentary is there, that the former queen of England, now late, one time she was in a lot of distress that had to do with her personal life. Among the many people she reached out to for advice and help and counsel was Billy Graham. There were other men of God in Europe, but she reached out to Billy Graham, history says. Are we together? There are many people who will not even study this. All we know is God will do it. And intelligent people look at us and say, what kind of people are these? When you want kings to call you, prepare to talk to them. Once you are talking to mediocre and mean men, and yet praying that God takes you to talk to kings, God cannot be mocked. You reap according to the quality of the seed you sow. You sow mediocrity, you remain with mediocres. So she reached out to Billy Graham, the documentary tells us, and Billy Graham sent her a text with one scripture comforting her. He said, I understand that things happen like this. And on account of her royalty and the things that she should understand that she's human and things happen like this. And then he sent a scripture of comfort. And then the secretary replied Billy Graham and told him how comforted she was on account of that. That was why no government could fight him. Even North Korea allowed him to preach there. Because there were governmental policies that a single nation cannot manipulate. And if a parliament, there are Christians who will be called to speak to UN. There are Christians who will be called to speak to African Union as single individuals. 
that on account of something you say and a correct representation of, a ki of the kingdom, void of blind fanatism, ignorance, and mediocrity, you translate spirituality to excellence, excellence that cannot be denied. Even those who are not saved will call you and say, we may not respect your God, but translate his value systems into a policy that translates to nation building. What you see that we're doing is only the beginning of a fire that can never be quenched. Breathe, Lord, breathe. Breathe, Lord, breathe. Breathe upon my life. I'm saying many will call you and say listen this organization is in confusion we hear you are a Christian and we like the context of your spirituality how much can we pay you come and help reorder this organization use the same value system that made your church dexterous import it to our organization and you tell them the condition is that you allow me hold a three-day crusade in your area they say we will sponsor it if it will help us listen i tell you the way evangelism will happen in the days coming will shock you it will be governments backing individuals because the profit factor of spirituality we will see the profit of spirituality to nation building that when we are praying in tongues, it's not just a fanatic jumping up and down. As we are jumping up and down, something is leaving heaven and entering your spirit. When you have the orientation, God will give you the influence. Did you hear what I said? When you have the orientation that represents the purposes of God, God will give you the influence. No man can promote himself. No. Promotion comes from God. Your assignment is to contend with the spirit of revelation. Let him breathe upon your spirit. Breathe upon your mind. Breathe upon your body. Breathe upon your understanding. Erode that mediocre understanding. Erode that mundane understanding. That small mindedness that is focused on self. That small mindedness that is focused on extremism and fanatism it will not win the nations for Jesus learn from Billy Graham Billy Graham remains an inspiration for me today because of the way he manifested the God life what a pride to the Christian faith in life and in death what a pride to heaven in life and in death Billy Graham made men love Jesus. He made men love the Christian faith. He didn't shout like we did. He didn't run around like we did. But he transported spirituality. The Holy Ghost walked in him. And he brought the gospel in a context that saved nations, saved leaders. He prayed for leaders. Some of those leaders gave access today. Some of the access we have to the nations today came because of the conviction of the men who were imparted by his ministry. Let me tell you this. Africa, we must tame our excesses. We must tame our idea of spirituality. Most of what we call spirituality is fanatism and extremism that misrepresents Jesus. We will keep making a mess of the continent before the world and bring reproach to the name of the Lord until we understand what the faith life and the faith pursuit is about. There are still over 7 billion people thereabout to come to Jesus Christ. In preparing my lecture notes for 
the lectures coming, it made me to learn a lot. I explored statistics of all kinds, derived ideas from intellectuals, from the economic realm, and several people like that, just in preparing the piece of, you know, thoughts that we'll be sharing. And I learned again how far behind we are in terms of our spiritual orientation. I tell you, is the reason why there are more churches, is the reason why there are more of us men of God, and yet you see that that penetrating power, the gatekeepers have not seen the Jesus they are looking for. Did you hear what I said? The gatekeepers that allow for a free flow of the gospel are looking for a kind of Jesus and a kind of spiritual orientation we have not yet presented. We must grow out of our petty small-mindedness and look globally and see to it that there is a burden upon us for the nations. It will not happen through extremism and fanatism. Again, learn from Billy Graham. Billy Graham is an extreme model and a worthy influence. Every believer that knows God and loves kingdom come, evangelist or otherwise, among the many followers you should follow, I tell you, I recommend for you, he's a man. I believe he has his imperfections. I believe he has his limitations. But he's a commendable model to guide your understanding. He is a very intelligent capture of translating spirituality to territorial transformation. Let me give you the final one, and then we'll pray. This is koinonia. Hmm. Number four, what is the assignment of the spirit of revelation with respect to deriving profit from scripture, kingdom advance, and destiny actualization? Are you ready? The spirit of revelation activates the various prophetic dimensions in the believer. The spirit of revelation activates the various prophetic dimensions in the believer. The spirit of revelation activates the various prophetic dimensions in the believer. Dreams, visions, word of knowledge, prophecy. There is a prophetic dimension to every believer. Whether you are called to the office of a prophet or not. The prophetic dimension is how you are able to interact with the spirit realm like you have learned here. Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29. Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29. Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward, he says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. How many? All flesh. He says, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. The young men shall see visions. Uh -huh. And upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit. The unifying factor is that regardless the age range, everyone had a prophetic experience, a dream, a vision, some kind of encounters. The spirit of revelation is responsible for activating the various prophetic dimensions in the believer. So as much as I've spoken about kingdom advance, next week is a miracle service. The word of knowledge will still come. The, the manifestations of the Spirit, the prophetic will still come. Are we together? The Holy Spirit helps us to manifest that prophetic dimension within us. Powerful. Jesus, by the Spirit of Revelation, looks and right from where he is, he says, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Nathaniel comes to him and says, you do not even know me. He said, no, this is not all intellect. While you were under the tree, I saw you. Ah, he was amazed. He said, Nathaniel, just because I told you this, you are surprised. He said, you will see greater things than this. You, with your own eyes, your prophetic being open, you will see the heavens open and the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. There is an advantage we have, believers. Our lives is not always spiritual, even though there is a spiritual dimension. Are we together? Our lives is not always intellectual, even though there is an intellectual dimension. There is a prophetic dimension to every believer. 
God can show you things to come. And when he, the spirit of truth, is come, the Bible says that he will guide you into all truth and he will show you the things to come. He will show you the things to come. He will show you the things to come. The Bible says no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. He says, but the spirit has revealed it to us. He has revealed it to us through his spirit, for the spirit searched all things, even the deep things of God. And the Bible says the reason why he does all of those things is that he would let us know the things that are freely given to us. Say, I'm a spiritual person. One more time, say, I'm a spiritual person. The spirit of revelation is at work in me. So he activates that prophetic dimension. That is the reason why, to the glory of God, when all the lectures and the discourses are done by night, mm, the Bible says, while shepherds watch their flocks by night. So you can be a lecturer by day and then you wear that regalia and let the devil know that I did not just come with a lecture note. I came in the spirit and the power to dislodge darkness, to stir up a fire for the kingdom. Mm. Believers, hear me. This Bible contains wholesome profiting to every believer. This Bible, I repeat, contains wholesome profiting to the believer. But that the Bible in itself is not flawless archaeologically. The Bible is not flawless historically. The Bible is not flawless linguistically. In fact, the Bible is not, is not flawless in terms of the accuracy and the facts of the things presented. But that the moment the Bible becomes channeled from a lens of the revelation of God, the revelation of man's state without God, the revelation of Jesus as the Savior and remedy to man and creation. Are we together? The revelation of the gospel and the revelation of salvation. The Bible becomes accurate regardless what you are reading and regardless the imperfections that your eye may observe. There is no degree of imperfection in the Bible that sustains the ability to derive a believer who stores it is by the spirit of revelation. Did you hear what I said? You, uh, to, to, the, to, you can never, never be deluded into error if you allow the spirit of revelation to guide your understanding and your interpretation of scripture. No. You can read the book of Leviticus and all you see are all kinds of sacraments, all practices. And it may not make sense to you, but because the spirit of revelation rests upon you, among the many words, and you sanctify the instruments of the temple and make sure this one expression will stand out and light comes from it. I come in the volume of the book. It was written about me to do your will. I come in the volume of the book, it was written about me, to do your will, O oh God. I come in the volume of the book, it was written about me, to do your will, O oh God. One more time. I come in the volume of the book. It was written about me to do your will, O oh God. He says, I and the children that the Lord has given me, we are for signs and for wonders in Israel. You know what a sign is? A sign is a pointer. A sign does not point itself. 
it tells you you are close to reality. The assignment of a sign is to let you know you are not far from the object of your pursuit. So when God makes you a sign and a wonder, the requirement to be a sign and a wonder is that you must be close to God. So that when people see you not too far from you, they see him. No matter whatever may come my way, I'll follow, I'll follow, I'll follow, I'll follow. No matter whatever may come my way, I'll follow, I'll follow, I'll follow, I'll follow. No matter whatever may come my way, I'll follow, I'll follow, I'll follow, I'll follow. The Lord placed it on my heart to teach you this. Because you see, my life changed, not just when I honored scripture. When the spirit of revelation came upon my life, the word of God made sense. That the word of God, in spite of the supposed controversies, in spite of the personalities, in spite of the obvious transition in knowledge that happened to some of the authors, it did not disrupt its ability to present the program of Christ completely. Let me remind you tonight again that the accuracy of scripture does not come from its archaeological presentation. The accuracy of scripture does not come from its historical presentation. The accuracy of scripture does not even come from its linguistic presentation or the interpretation prowess. No, it comes from its ability to maneuver through the imperfections and still present the program of God with precision and accuracy. And that in order of priority, the compass, the navigation point for every believer must be to know that the primary assignment of scripture is not for business. The primary assignment of scripture is not for marriage. The primary assignment of scripture, are we together? Is not for prosperity. The primary assignment of scripture is not for increase, is not for greatness. The primary assignment of scripture is to help men understand God, understand the state of man outside God, understand Jesus. Are we together now? As a representation of the Father's love to man, understand the gospel and understand salvation in its entirety. When that becomes the focal point, the true north in your pursuit, then the Bible will be accurate regardless what it is. And then when you have that sorted, then the spirit of revelation in partnership with any part of scripture can help you derive profit and value that attends to any other area of your life. So you will find yourself, in addition to knowing God, excelling in business by scripture, excelling in your marriage by scripture, rising in influence in scripture, intellectual advantage by scripture. Are we together? Your organization becoming dexterous and profitable. You are a leader with a difference, deriving principles and lessons from scripture. This is how the spirit of revelation operates. The spirit of revelation does not leave us as fanatics, as extremists, no. It translates the value of spirituality to a context that leads to our own salvation, our wholesome victory, and then can help us extend the love, the value system, and the intelligence of the kingdom to all and sundry. This is what we are called to do. This is what we must position ourselves to do. So in the midst of the falling and rising, in the midst of the spending hours and praying, profitably so, in the midst of the burning of night candles, reading scripture, in the midst of consulting other materials, lexicons and commentaries and concordances, you must have this at the back of your mind, that your compass for navigating the thoughts of God 
when you promote your wanting to become a businessman from scripture beyond God, Jesus, man, and salvation, the Bible will no longer profit you. The mistake we make is not that all the other aspects we are pursuing from scripture are not supposed to bless us, but they are not supposed to be the focal point. The focal point in the study of scripture is the testimony of the love of God revealed in and through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus. Man and creation being the object of that sacrifice. Are we together? And the entire mercy plan is captured in what we call the gospel, captured in what we call salvation. When you have that as a pillar, every other blessing that comes from scripture becomes an addition, not a replacement. So the idea is not to stop deriving business profit from scripture, marital profit from scripture, societal profit from scripture, intellectual profit from scripture. No, that would be error. But that we must return back to the focal purpose of scripture. Scripture never contradicts itself with respect to revealing God, salvation, the state of man, and Jesus. Regardless the complexities around the authors, the, the lives of the authors, the Bible tells us that God prevailed over the people such that every information there, the richest capture and the richest expression of accuracy in scripture is with respect to the knowledge of God and the plan of salvation. So the next time you read your Bible, you can use various verses in scripture to attend to various areas of your life, you are not in error. But when you want to study the Bible for growth, don't study it as a business manual. Study it as a spiritual book that intends to reveal God, reveal your state, reveal Jesus, reveal God's program. When you understand that, you will never be in error, regardless what you find there. Please rise up on your feet. No matter whatever may come, my way, I'll follow, I'll follow, no matter what. I want you to hold hands with someone by your left and right if you can. We're going to pray two serious prayers in this place. The first prayer is you are going to cry for a fresh baptism of the spirit of revelation. Paul said that I may know him. He knew many things, but his focus was him. Not that I may know it. There were many it's he knew. He, it was Paul that brought order to the program of God. Order to how many things be done. But he said that I may know him. Let that be your prayer. By the spirit of revelation, Lord, help me to know you. Help me to understand Jesus. Help me to understand your prophetic program as far as the gospel and salvation is concerned. Someone is praying, praying with seriousness, praying with sincerity from the depth of your heart. If you are a man of God, pray. Your members are at the mercy of your understanding. Pray. No matter how much you have deviated, there is still room to square up your understanding for the sake of those you lead and for the sake of your own growth. Go ahead and pray. The spirit of revelation comes to our lives, connecting us to God's eternal plan, helping us to understand the gospel, to understand salvation, and to understand the program of God. The spirit of revelation Drawing out lessons, cautions, drawing out principles from scripture that help the believer to walk in total victory. The spirit of revelation, inspiring the spirits and the minds of believers, giving us the ability to birth thoughts, to birth ideas that empower us to be productive that empowers to sponsor advancement at a personal level, at a societal level, at a territorial level. The spirit of revelation at 
activating the prophetic dimension that is inherent in every believer. Helping us to take advantage of the prophetic resources we have at our disposal to live excelling Christian lives. Dreams, visions, revelations, the prophetic. I choose the way of the Lord. I want to establish the second prayer point. I choose the way of the Lord. For the way of the Lord is the way of wisdom. I choose the way of the Lord. For the way of the Lord is the way of wisdom. I choose the way of the Lord. One more time, sing it from your heart. For the way of the Lord is the way of wisdom. I choose the way of the Lord. Hallelujah. The second prayer point, listen please. The second prayer point is a burden in my heart that I'm sharing with you. We are going to pray for the body of Christ. Lord, let the spirituality in the body of Christ translate to profit and value that exalts Jesus and frontiers the cause of the kingdom. We are tired of fanatism. We are tired of extremism. Are we together? We are tired of the interruptions that our human nature is bringing to the program of God. You are going to pray and say, Lord, breathe upon us. We are available vessels. Let our praying in tongues, let our fastings, let our Bible studies, let our consecrations translate to value that our world can see. Christians and non-Christians, governments, leaders, heads of state, captains of industry, that they can see the profit point of serving God through our lives. Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray. Pray for the body of Christ. Pray for the body of Christ. We are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but it is put on a lampstand, a candlestick, and it gives light to all who are there. Take a minute and pray. We pray for the body of Christ in Nigeria. We pray for the body of Christ in Africa. We pray for the body of Christ in Europe the body of Christ in America, the body of Christ in Asia, in the name of Jesus, let us come as a corporate people into a season where the love, the values, the character, the power, the wisdom, the profitability that comes from being a Christian, the profitability, the value that comes by being a person of faith, let it be translated to nation building. Let it be translated to territorial transformation. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, if we do not restore the correct context of approaching the Christian faith, we stand a risk we stand a risk of deviating a whole generation towards a sincere path that may purport to helping us find God and live meaningful lives and will leave many in disappointment. When you are young, a lot of mistakes in your approach to knowing God may not tell because the consequences are not immediate. But as you grow older in leadership, in age and in life, are we together? The wrong perception about God
begins to tell on your life, tell on your children, tell on your organization. You can afford to be in error as a young man and the difference will not show. Are we together? But as God begins to help you, as you become a leader in any capacity, you begin to see the effect of your ill or lack of complete understanding of the ways of God. It will deviate institutions, deviate individuals, deviate men. That is the reason why sometimes people purport that the church is where intelligent people come and become dummies. It ought not to be so. A preacher should not make people fools because they came to church. Are we together? So that parents and families will not stop their children from coming to church because they cannot see the relevance of the things that we teach. We stand a risk, I tell you this prophetically, if we do not reorder and redefine spirituality and respect our territories as we communicate our Christian persuasions, let us not take the intelligence of the people who are loyal to us for granted. Are we together? The church should not be an expression of caricature, a venting of mediocrity and small-mindedness. We must respect the territories wherein God has planted us. And we must respect the fact that the people who come to us are looking for God, are intelligent people, and have alternatives. A man should not carry his wife and children and family as a CEO who loves the Lord and come and sit down under the mentorship of a man of God only to learn nonsense. Are we together? And then at the end, the man looks stupid, his wife looks stupid, the children look stupid. They cannot see the value of their spirituality. Their lives begin to go down from the day they become members. The principles that brought excellence, intelligence, integrity, and power to their lives, those policies are no longer there. It ought not to be so. Are we together? And so I want to encourage you, go back and listen to this message. Are we together? Listen to this message again. Listen to this message again. Listen to this message again. Pray with it. Download it and listen. Don't assume because you were here, you understood it. Share it in love with anybody interested in learning God and living out spirituality to a context that profits the program of God and profits the society. Ignoring the society wherein you are planted is selfishness. You must factor in the fact that you came to that society as an object of God's mercy. You must factor in the effect of your spirituality or otherwise and the effect of your orientation on their overall well-being. Extremism and fanatism is the number one religious problem across our continent and plaguing other people. It is extremism that has produced all shades of error that right now governments are grappling to manage. At the back of the perpetrators of this thing is a supposed sincere pursuit, but it's ended up bringing all kinds of terrorist sects and all of that. At the back of anything that destroys society is an orientation. And those who perpetrate it believe that they are communicating truth or pleasing some kind of deity somewhere. It's important to restore Christianity spirituality the faith practice as intended by god have you been blessed tonight let me give somebody an opportunity tonight to come to this jesus please keep standing we're wrapping up let's respect the altar call you heard me preaching while i spoke about the bible while i spoke about the spirit of revelation and whilst you listen the spirit of god began to prick you like he did paul and the Spirit of God is telling you right now that you are part of the many that someday will have the opportunity to serve His purposes. God is calling you. There's no point being ashamed. There's no point being afraid. This is home for you. Wherever you are, I want you to leave your seat as I count one to five. This is a house of love. You can never be too far away that Jesus cannot bring you back. The, the epicenter of the gospel is the love of Jesus and his ability to save even to the uttermost. Now you come as I count. One, let's celebrate them as they come. Two,
three. Come, win that war. Come, come to Jesus. Regardless where you are, what you have done or not done, what you know or don't know, just come. Jesus is home. Jesus is the beginning. He's called the author, young and old, male and female. And for those connecting across the globe, he's given you an opportunity to know him. This is why he gave the Holy Spirit. This is why he gave us access to the word. Come. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you, all of you. Please, if you're joining them, come very quickly. I want to thank you for heeding to this call. Thank you for winning that war, summoning the courage to come and stand before Jesus. Let me tell you what this Bible says, that as many who will come to him, he will in no wise cast away. This is Jesus for you. The Jesus we present is the one who gives hope. The Jesus we present is the one who is always merciful, always kind, always loving. And provided your heart is open to receive of his mercy, you can never be too far that he cannot draw you. For some of you, he's giving you a new beginning. For some of you, you are recommitting yourself. It doesn't matter what category you belong to. I want you to lift your right hand and say this after me convincingly. Know that you are talking to Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight, I have heard your word. I declare that I love you with all my heart. I declare that you are the son of God. I declare that you died for me and you rose again for my justification. Right now, I receive you into my heart and I declare that you are my savior, you are my Lord, you are my king. The power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. From tonight until forever, I am a child of God. I go from glory to glory, grace to grace. Amen. Keep your beautiful hands lifted and I pray for you. Father, thank you. Because your word declares that as many who will come to you, you will in no wise cast away. Thank you for your good hand upon these ones. Thank you for the authority of scripture. And by that authority, I declare your sins forgiven. I call you bona fide recipients of the life of God. I declare that you are empowered to live victorious spiritual lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken and destroyed forever over your life. You are empowered to walk in victory, to experience God, and to reveal him to your world. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Please look to your right. That would be my right. That would be your left. There are counselors who will have a brief word with you. Please do cooperate with them. They'll have just a minute or two with you and you're back to your seat. Let's honor them as they go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So... Okay, that's true. Please correct the date. I apologize. I think I, we made an adjustment of the date for our conference during our leaders' meeting. So the date I gave you was an old one. Please correct it. The date for the, our global Koinonia conference is Thursday 21st to Sunday 24th. My sincere apologies. Please correct it, my dear people. Media, make sure you correct it. So all those who received 17th, I remember during the meeting, we had to adjust it so that it meets with the miracle service. So it's November, Thursday, November 21st to Sunday 21st, 24th. Please accept our apologies for um, the miscommunication. So next week, I'll take our time to announce it one more time. Next week is our miracle service. Hallelujah. A miracle service for the month of March by Saturday we are back by God's grace and then ready and prepared for the miracle service please invite everyone 
I want you to know that the miracle services are not just times to display power, but it is God reaching out to people. People are hurting, people are wounded, people are sick, they need Jesus. If it is true that Jesus is the answer, we must give people an opportunity to experience him. We must give people an opportunity to love him, to know him, and we must reveal him, not just in his wisdom, but also in his power. So please invite everyone, come on Sunday, and let's celebrate Jesus and celebrate his power and experience him in our lives and extend the same to others. Have you been blessed tonight? I speak over your life in the name of Jesus. You are and remain a sign and a wonder. You are and remain a sign and a wonder. May my God keep lifting you. May my God keep blessing you. May my God keep empowering you. There will not be a better yesterday for you. You keep going from glory to glory from grace to grace in the name of Jesus every area of challenge in your life I declare this week may you experience the hand of God there experience the favor of God someone is getting to know Jesus through you someone is getting transformed through your witness someone is getting healed through your life someone is rising above curses and yokes through your life go and represent Jesus in the mighty name of Jesus Christ now together, let's share the grace in fellowship. And when we do that, please do greet someone. Give them a big hug after service. Just appreciate them on your way out. Let's share the grace in fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Rest and abide with us now and forever. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercies follow us all the days of our lives as we dwell in our... Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the video to yourself. Share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our homepage for more of our messages. Subscribe to the channel. Comment on it. Like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. The phase of development. Lord, grant me the discipline.